Oxypora, Echinopora, Echinophilia, Mycidium, Lithophyllin. What do these corals all have in common? You can surmise from the title of the video that they're all chalice corals, but what does that even mean? Let's get into it right now. How's it going guys? Welcome back to another coral spotlight here at Tidal Gardens. This one is all about chalice corals, which is more of an overarching blanket category rather than a particular coral species. So spotlight, this video might be more like a floodlight. If you're new to the channel and like these coral spotlights, you can join the community by hitting the subscribe button. We have many more videos like this planned. Also, be sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date on all of our new uploads, because these days YouTube really does not want to send out notifications unless you explicitly tell them to. Anyhow, without further ado, let's talk about chalices. Chalice corals represent a large group of wildly disparate corals that share little in common past their flat, plate-forming appearance. There are over 10 genera of corals that are all grouped together and described as chalices. This isn't a scientific designation, but rather a construct of the aquarium hobby that just kind of stuck with people. It's similar to how a bunch of different genera are lumped together as brain corals. As such, a brain coral could mean anything from oilophilia, to tracheophilia, to favia, to lobophilia, you get the picture. These corals are also very different from one another. The difference is, the hobby recognizes each of these genera separately, as well as collectively, as brain corals. Chalice corals are different in the sense that the vast majority of hobbyists are not that familiar with any particular genus of chalice coral. Even someone like me who deals with coral for a living can get a little foggy on whether a particular chalice is an oxypora versus an echinopora versus an echinophilia, and I don't think that I'm alone in that confusion. If you take a moment and do a Google image search for these corals, you'll find a great deal of overlap and plenty of misidentification as well. Although their exact classification can be a murky topic, their impact in the reef aquarium hobby is crystal clear. Chalice corals are one of the most highly desirable large polyp stony corals in the industry. This is due in large part to the colors and patterns chalices are capable of expressing. High-end chalices often have intensely fluorescent colors and can display striking patterns. My personal favorites look like glowing, melted crayons. In terms of their distribution in the wild, chalice corals are found all over the Pacific. Given their broad distribution, one would be led to assume that they're readily available in the hobby, but lately that has not been the case. At the time of this recording, there's currently an import-export ban in Indonesia and Fiji where many of these corals come from so most of the specimens available in the trade are being imported out of Australia. It is still possible to find aquaculture chalices grown domestically that originated from Indonesia or Fiji, but they're in short supply and often fetch very high prices when they are available. Now that we've covered some background on chalices, let's go over some care tips. Coming up with general care requirements is tough for chalices because of how different some of the corals are from one another. For each of the recommendations, bear in mind that they're merely guidelines that will give you a starting point to experiment with. My goal is to suggest parameters that will give the most kinds of chalices the best chance of survival. Optimizing tank conditions for a particular specimen is going to require some degree of experimentation because different chalices are, well, different. Quote-unquote ideal conditions 
will depend a great deal on the specific species of chalice and also how that chalice adapts over time to your tank. Alright, first tip, let's go over lighting. I recommend moderate lighting levels, around 100 par. Most types of chalice corals are adaptable to different lighting intensities, but the first priority should always be don't blow away corals with light. It doesn't take very long to overexpose chalice corals that can lead to bleaching and a rapid decline in health. It's far better to provide substandard lighting intensity and slowly correct the situation by adjusting the light or placement of the chalice coral rather than accidentally blasting the coral with too much light and then trying to help it recover after it bleaches. The other reason why I would not be in a huge hurry to go crazy on light is that for the most part, chalice corals are pretty consistent with their coloration. Sure, there's always going to be some degree of variability and the occasional outlier that can change their color in noticeable ways, but overall, there is not a lot to be gained by messing with lighting. I would aim for moderate, consistent light and just let the coral adapt to the lighting conditions on its own. One last point that I'll mention about lighting is bringing out fluorescence in chalices. Many species of chalice corals are highly fluorescent under actinic blue LED lights and are real showstoppers. Even if you're a diehard metal halide or T5 fan, you're missing out if you haven't seen chalice corals under full actinic LED illumination. Consider just getting one inexpensive strip just for that late night viewing. Let's now talk briefly about water chemistry. Chalice corals are LPS, meaning as stony corals, they require consistent levels of calcium, alkalinity, and to a lesser degree, magnesium, in order to grow their calcium carbonate skeletons. People often ask what the levels of specific corals should be, and I pretty much always answer with natural seawater levels, with an emphasis on consistency over specific values. I would go as far as saying it's better to have suboptimal levels of calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium consistently rather than trying to fix low levels overnight with additives. If you're experiencing low levels, say for example, low alkalinity, you can add a supplement to boost it, but first double check your test results and test kit to make sure that you're actually experiencing low levels and then make the change slowly over the course of weeks until you reach a level more in line with natural seawater levels. To maintain consistent levels, the amount of supplementation will depend a lot on the size and growth rate of stony corals in your tank. There are some chalice corals like lithophyllin that are pretty slow growing and, and don't really soak up a ton of major elements. On the other hand, Fast-growing corals like Echinopora might be much more demanding on your reef's chemistry. On average, a typical reef aquarium focusing mainly on just chalice corals and perhaps some other slow-growing LPS might get away with doing water changes to replenish major and minor elements, but it's always a good idea to periodically test to make sure your levels are not all out of control. Calcium and alkalinity aside, Stony corals are sometimes more sensitive to declining water quality. In particular, pay attention to elevated nitrate levels. Low nitrate levels around, let's say, 5 to 10 parts per million are actually welcome for large polyp stony corals. But around 30 to 40 parts per million of nitrate, you might start running into some issues. If I see a coral suddenly start receding, my mind immediately goes to possible nitrate issues. Now to remedy elevated nitrates, I look to up nutrient removal through more aggressive protein skimming, detritus removal, and more frequent water changes. You can try to limit nutrient input by cutting back on feeding but personally, I tend to favor heavier feeding and dealing with the possible overages than underfeeding because on average, I think that most aquariums, they're just simply not getting enough food. That's just me though, so that's something that you're gonna have to experiment with on your own system. 
since we're on the topic of feeding, let's go over feeding and nutrition for chalice corals. Chalices are considered photosynthetic corals, meaning they have a symbiotic relationship with dinoflagellates living in their flesh called zooxanthellae. Strictly speaking, the zooxanthellae are the organisms carrying out the actual photosynthesis, but the coral animal benefits by accessing the byproducts of their photosynthetic activity, namely the simple sugars that are produced. Although chalice corals derive much of their nutritional needs from the byproducts of photosynthesis, they're also capable feeders. Here at Tidal Gardens, we have tried feeding chalices a number of different types of food ranging from frozen foods to pellet foods to powders, you get the idea. Chalices do not have a pronounced polyp extension, so their feeding response can be difficult to monitor. Typically, these corals utilize a mucus coat to capture food and slowly draw it into their mouths, which can be seen during feeding time lapses. Feeding can be hit or miss though, so it's something that you're going to have to play with and figure out what foods to feed and what types of chalices like what. This chalice, for example, wanted nothing to do with either frozen food or powdered food. Like I said, your mileage may vary. Let's move on to water flow. Like light, water flow is not something that I would go crazy with. Moderate water movement is what I would recommend. Too little flow and you run the risk of allowing detritus to settle on the colonies, which creates dead spots. Several species of chalice corals naturally form a bowl shape, and there has to be enough flow to sweep away anything that would otherwise settle in the middle. Too much flow, and you run the risk of the coral falling off the rockwork. Their plating shape once again plays a role, because if there's a lot of flow, the colony acts like a sail and can lift off the rocks and either base plant down to the substrate, or worse yet, onto another coral. This scenario is particularly bad because most chalices are something that I would call hyper-aggressive. They're not aggressive in the same way, say, Galaxia or some Euphilia are that extend sweeper tentacles, but any contact by the body of a chalice with another coral is going to be bad news. I should say that most types of chalice corals don't extend sweeper tentacles because there's always exceptions, there are some that do. For example, Hollywood Stunner is a bright green plating variety that's capable of extending sweeper tentacles up to about 6 inches. For those out there that are unfamiliar with sweeper tentacles, sweeper tentacles are a hostile measure where the coral polyp can extend one or several tentacles while concentrating their stinging cells at the very tip. If you happen to have a coral, not just a chalice, but any coral that's known to send out sweeper tentacles, plan on giving it plenty of extra space because they can really do some serious persistent damage to all other corals around it. Now that we've gone over care tips for chalice corals, I want to touch on the subject of propagation. Chalice corals overall are a great candidate for long-term sustainable aquaculture. Some varieties of chalice naturally propagate better than others, but I have a couple of tips that might help regardless. The times that I see hobbyists struggle to propagate this coral, it's usually for two reasons. The first is underestimating what makes them an aggressive coral. The mucus and other chemicals that are released by cutting them persists on the tools used for propagation. Oftentimes, these tools are then used to cut several different chalices in the same fragging session. By using the same tools on different kinds of chalices, you might get some undesirable interactions. I encourage people cutting chalices to try to clean everything in between cutting different species. That means cleaning off bone cutters, saw blades, and making up new water for the saw each coral. The second problem with propagating chalice corals is that they can be a challenge to glue down to a new substrate. It can be frustrating to cut perfect little frags and then to have them all dislodged the next day because the glue failed. There's no perfect method for getting them to stick down, 
but one thing that can help is to use a generous dollop of gel superglue and then immediately spray it with an instant set product. I'll put an Amazon affiliate link in the description below for those that are interested. That pretty much does it for Chalice Corals. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you'd like more information or perhaps purchase Chalice Corals for your home aquarium, I invite you to visit us at TitleGardens.com and see what varieties that we have in stock. As always, don't forget to leave a like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you all next time. Happy reefing.